Well, we will get started. We are at the Bewitching Hour, and I wanted to welcome you to the TMCC Annual Recognition of the U.S. Constitution Day Forum. Uh, this is an event that has been occurring because we've had to do it, sad to report. A number of years ago, a federal law was passed called the Byrd Amendment that now requires all institutions to do a program like this once a year. What we as colleagues found rather ironic is that it's such a great idea, why weren't we already doing this? Uh, we, in essence, love the opportunity to take a look at our Constitution, to stimulate discussion, dialogue, and debate about aspects of the Constitution and its relevance today. And this session is really designed to do that. I wanted to begin by introducing our august panelists, if I could, in fact, ask each to introduce themselves. Um. I am Dr. John Kemp. I am a professor in uh, European history. I think I'm here to make already brilliant people look even more brilliant. <laughs> uh, Precious Hall, political science. Brian Fletcher, political science. And I'm Fred Locken. I'm chair of like the coolest department ever, just amalgamated. It's business, history, political science, and culinary arts. <laughs> so. Don't ask. So, uh, we really appreciate your being here today. We have uh, identified this year's topic as looking at presidential power, the role of the executive, and the U.S. Constitution. We will be doing a very structured program today. We, we have a series of questions that we want to respond to as a panel. I would ask that if you have questions that are related to the discussion, that you save them because we'd kind of like to have the discussion, allow the creative flow of ideas and reactions, and then we will assure you that we will have time available after that to be able to pose any of the questions that you have to our panelists. Uh, we will uh, watch the clock, but we will be pretty sprightly. We'll be able to easily meet the, the needs of the Today program uh, within the time allotted. Maybe, maybe just get out a little early, we'll see. So if our panelists are ready, we are excited to start with the very first question. According to the framers of the Constitution, what was the intended role of the executive branch relative to the other two branches? And Dr. Kemp, since you're the closest and I can see you, why don't we start with you? <laughs> All right, well, um, my understanding um, of, the, uh, uh, of the Constitution and from what I've read, um, I think that James Madison, who wrote up the Virginia Plan, which ultimately, in many, many ways, um, was, became the Constitution of the United States, I think his concern was more directed at the legislative branch, branch and therefore I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe that the more spe most specific things um, uh, that define power uh, were directed at the legislative branch. branch. Uh, the executive branch, um, I think, just was to execute the laws. Uh, to be that, um, that institution that would carry out the laws voted on by the, legis by the legislature, our uh, legislative branch. Um, that evolves, that changes as time goes on. We'll be talking about that. Um, but I think basically for uh, first uh, six or seven presidents, that's mostly what they did. They simply stayed within their uh, powers defined and executed the laws until Andrew Jackson, I think, and then he began to throw personality into all that um, and did what he wanted to do, not so much what the Constitution said. But I think that um, uh, the intended role was pretty specific, um, and, uh, uh, and it was just to execute the laws, but that's my reading of it. Thank you, Dr. Kemp. Oh, guess I'm next. Shout out to my students. Nice of you to be. Thank you. All right. So I would say that in reading the Constitution and comparing what was in the Constitution to the Articles of Confederation, that the role that the framers intended for the president is actually twofold, meaning that the president has a domestic role and an international role and a foreign policy role. So definitely on the domestic side, I agree with John that the intent of the framers was to have the president serve as a check on the legislative branch of government, but also alternatively looking at the foreign policy side or the international side, the reason why this office was created, this position was created so, so that we could have someone to represent our country in regards to what was happening with foreign affairs, what was happening with other countries. So there's a little more power that the executive has in the Constitution dealing with foreign powers than domestic powers. So definitely one, it serves as a check on the legislative legislative branch, and secondly, it serves as a means for us to engage in the international community. 
I guess I'm last. Uh, I agree with uh, what both Dr. Hall and uh, Dr. Kemp said. I just add a couple more things. Uh, one thing to remember when you're thinking about the framers is that they didn't agree on everything. And so the framers actually did disagree as to the role of the executive. Uh, some of the framers wanted to have a more powerful executive branch, and notably uh, Alexander Hamilton or uh, uh, James Wilson. Uh, some wanted a very, very weak executive branch. And I interestingly enough, uh, John points out uh, that uh, Madison was much more concerned about the legislative branch. And if you actually read through Madison's notes on the convention, there isn't a whole lot of discussion during the Constitutional Convention about the actual powers of the executive branch. They spent a lot of time talking about how you're going to elect the president. They spent a lot of time talking about whether or not you should have one president or three presidents. Uh, they do spend some time on presidential power, but not nearly as much time on some of those other issues, including uh, how the legislature is going to work. The other thing that uh, I just like to remind, uh, especially my students, because you're going to be tested on this in a couple of days, <laughs> is uh, the, the framers uh, also had a bit of a Goldilocks problem. Uh, they were very fearful of an executive that would be like King George. And uh, they wanted to make sure that whatever they created uh, didn't have the ability to become uh, another king. But they also had experienced the failures of the Articles of Confederation and uh, recognized uh, that one of the reasons why the Articles didn't do so well is because there wasn't uh, a, a leader uh, who could uh, kind of bring the country forward, represent the country uh, completely. And so the question they had to try and address was, how can you create a, an executive which isn't going to turn into a king, uh, but is going to be powerful enough to avoid some of the difficulties that the Articles uh, faced? And uh, I think a lot of what we're likely to discuss today is uh, whether or not uh, they managed to uh, strike that balance correctly. Thank you. And I'd like to do a brief follow-up on that because the question had asked about both uh, of the other branches, and I would appreciate your view on the relationship between the executive and the judiciary as well. So uh, if Dr. Kemp could start with that, just to, what you imagine the founders intended be the relationship between the executive and the judiciary? Well, I guess the relationship um, is flirtatious. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you, it's getting a little bit beyond anything that I know. I can't answer intelligently, and I'm not going to BS my way through it. So, okay. Um, Good for you. <laughs> that sounds fair. <laughs> Respectable. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think that the framers really had much of an intention of a relationship between the executive and the judicial branch. And that's evidence in the fact that the framers didn't say much about the judicial branch in the Constitution. Outside of appointing judges and having that power checked by the Senate, I don't think that there was much foresight given to what that relationship would actually look like. Yeah, so uh, as uh, many of you who are Political Science 101 students are going to learn, uh, when you get to the judiciary, uh, the judiciary was considered by the framers to be the least dangerous branch because it had the least amount of power. Uh, in the Constitution, the judiciary really doesn't get to do that much except decide matters of law. Uh, the checks that now the judiciary has against uh, the executive branch uh, and judicial review don't actually come about until uh, Marbury versus Madison, which is a court case that's decided in 1803. Uh, they did not really discuss that at the Constitutional Convention itself, although uh, Hamilton, when writing the parts of the Federalist Papers, did think that the, the courts would need that sort of power. And so in terms of uh, the framers of the Constitutional Convention, uh, Dr. Hall uh, is exactly right. It wasn't a huge consideration for them. I, I do think some of the framers, and again, I've talked a little bit about the fact we don't want to view the framers uniformly, but some of the framers, especially uh, Hamilton, recognized that you might need a, a, a judicial branch that would be able to play an effective check. Thank you. Uh, we could start with Dr. Hall with this next question. If the framers of the Constitution were alive today, they'd be very old. Uh, what would they think about the current state of executive power? All right. <laughs> I think that if the framers of the Constitution were alive today at this very moment in time, uh, some of them might wish they were dead. 
Uh, and that's a strong statement, and that's no offense to the current president, but I think that what they would notice is there are so many things happening today that there's no way that they could have ever accounted for these things during the Constitutional Convention in 1787. So I say in jest that some of them would wish they were dead, but really what I mean is that some of them, if they were alive today, would not recognize the country that is today based on what they had in mind in 1787. And part of that is just because obviously in 1787, you have no idea how technological advances will occur, et cetera. But also part of that is too that the society that existed in 1787 is not the society that exists today. So we have a more diverse society, we have a more educated society, and none of that was a forethought of the framers of the Constitution. So they would be in complete shock and dismay over what's happening. I think they would also be happy to know that their system of checks and balances does still work. I think they would be happy to know that the fundamental principles still work, but I think they would be in complete shock because they would have no means of expecting all that has occurred and all that is the presidency in the 21st century. Me? Dr. Oh, sure. Fletcher. So, uh, yeah, shock, I think, is a, a good term. Uh, and uh, it's uh, important to have a little bit of historical context here. Uh, we now talk about the president as the most powerful person on the face of the planet. Uh, you have to remember in 1787, when they're designing uh, the Constitution, uh, the United States was, uh, was not a powerful country. Uh, it wasn't a, a large country either. So fast forward uh, 200 plus years, uh, now uh, the president is commander in chief of the world's most powerful military. And that's not something uh, that the, the framers could have necessarily envisioned. Uh, the president is now in charge of a bureaucracy that's uh, about three million people uh, large. Uh, Washington just had a handful of people in uh, his first administration. And so part of the reason why they'd be shocked is just because uh, the United States is a much different place in 2017 uh, than it uh, was in uh, 1787. Uh, I think there are a couple other things that uh, they, they would think. I think they would really be surprised uh, by uh, the relationship between the president and Congress. And uh, we're gonna talk more about that later on in uh, uh, our presentations. But I think they'd be really surprised by how much power Congress has ceded to the president and uh, how much the president now drives policy making. So uh, when the framers wrote the Constitution, when they were thinking about the relationship between the executive branch and uh, the legislative branch, they really did think that the president would have sort of a national base and then the members of Congress would have uh, sort of their state or local district bases, uh, in part because of the nationalization of elections, in part because uh, the way the media works nowadays. Uh, often the bases are indistinguishable, and as a result of that, the, the president drives a lot more policy than I think the framers could have ever uh, imagined happening. Uh, the other thing I think they'd be surprised is by how much power Congress has actually given to the president. Uh, so uh, a lot of things that the, the framers actually thought Congress would have more of a say in, say for example with foreign policy and uh, wars, the Congress is sort of uh, backed off and uh, let the president uh, play a, a much greater role than perhaps I, I, they envisioned a president would be able to. Thank you. John, anything to add? I okay. agree. <laughs> no, no. Actually, no, I, I agree that the, uh, the founding fathers would be shocked. Um, uh, how could any one of us, if we're projected 230 years into the, into the future, we would be shocked at what we would see. I mean, I don't think that, I think that's, that's, that's true. Um, but even though um, I think that the, uh, the United States, as it has, uh, has uh, developed, would be not at all what they would have conceived, um, and essentially they were a bunch of elitist snobs, um, I think that uh, they were wise enough to create a system deliberately that could evolve, um, that could change with the changing political and social needs um, of our country over the past two and a half, cent uh, almost two and a half centuries. Um, so even though they may have been shocked, I think, personally, I think they would have been pleased that this system of government has stayed strong and stable regardless, and because of the way they wrote it. Um, um, as these centuries have passed and, and the changes have occurred. It's still an extraordinary thing historically. Um, uh, and the United States Constitution is amazing. Um, I don't know the specifics, but I do know that historically, in my opinion. 
that's uh, it's an incredible achievement. And I think they would be pleased, in a sense, um, to see that it's still strong and stable. If anyone would be uh, wanting to address the question, it's kind of the critical uh, thinking question that comes from what you've just said. The founders certainly intended a, a structure that was based on the separation of powers where there was rough equality amongst the three branches of government. Why do you think presidential power is so much greater in 2017? Certainly not intended or expected by the founders, but why did power flow to the presidency? Any of you that want to. Otherwise, I'll be happy to answer the question. I guess I'll start. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll call you into the bridge. Right. Yeah, and I'll bring up the rear. <laughs> um, so the reality is that presidents have become more power powerful, not necessarily because of what's in the Constitution, but what's not in the Constitution. So in other words, they have been, and this is not just the current president, but we've seen power steadily increasing over the years. Presidents have been uh, very skillful at being able to walk a line, meaning that they follow what's in the Constitution, but they're very skillful at finding out what's not in the Constitution and walking that question, questionable line of, can we do it, can we not do it? So presidents, I believe, have been very skillful at um, really testing the other branches in terms of seeing just how far they're going to go and checking the office or the branch, but they realize that their greatest power lies by not what's in the Constitution explicitly, but what is implied through what is in the Constitution. Yeah, so just to build on that a little bit, I think the view of a lot of uh, presidents in the 1800s, with the exception of the Jefferson, Jackson, and uh, Lincoln, is uh, that uh, what they were supposed to do is what was explicitly spelled out in Article 2 of the Constitution. If you actually look at Article 2 of the Constitution, uh, there aren't a whole lot of really great powers for the president. So a lot of the powers that we often talk about with respect to the president, uh, that uh, here potentially she is commander in chief, or that they get to appoint uh, judges, uh, those have congressional checks, specifically uh, uh, Senate checks, right? Uh, if you just look at Article 2, the only powers really that the president has all to him or potentially herself are making speeches, you know, the State of the Union, and uh, granting pardons. Uh, uh, it, modern presidents have really taken the, the approach uh, that Dr. Hall is talking about, which is it, it, I'm not just limited based on what the Constitution says I'm allowed to do. Uh, I'm allowed to do anything the Constitution says I'm, uh, up to the point which it says I'm not allowed to do it. And so they've taken a much more expansive uh, view of things. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt basically uh, gave the following opinion. He didn't give it while he was president. I think he gave it in one of his uh, memoirs. He said, if the Constitution doesn't say I can't do it, then I can do it. Uh, and uh, that is a much different perspective on presidential power. And uh, modern presidents, your Roosevelt's, uh, uh, your uh, Bush's, your uh, Reagan's, your Obama's, and perhaps even your Trump's, uh, they, they definitely have taken that to heed and used that as a guide for how they approach the presidency. Well, I can't quite follow up the erudition of these two brilliant uh, uh, political <laughs> scientists, um, but when I look at it, I see, um, you know, as far as the changes in evolution, uh, those individuals who have been presidents, I mean, they have personalities. Um, and they have their own goals and their own wants and needs and, and uh, begin to put that into the presidency and in, and in a sense kind of change the presidency like, like Jackson, Andrew Jackson. Um, he's the first to begin to veto things just because he didn't like it, not so much because it didn't go, it went against the Constitution. Um, he imposed his personality and his forceful self um, into the whole process. And so I think the personalities and the agendas of different presidents um, have contributed as well as uh, um, uh, events like wars and stuff like that, um, needing a, I think, a much more centralized uh, 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 decision-making uh, system um, uh, to kind of push it instead of debating in, in legislature, the president as the commander in chief is, and as the executor is the one who kind of gets more power. Um, so I, like I say, I think it's just the situation or the personality that have helped evolve um, the, the presidency. Um, just to follow up, I think one of the things that we have to understand, and this is just a natural progression, is as time goes on, we're, we will get further and further from the intent of the framers because the framers aren't here to tell us what they meant. So it's different to look at the first few presidents because they were the ones who actually wrote the Constitution, so they knew what they meant in Article 2. We are now on the 45th president, so imagine just a long line of the game telephone. 
So you're, by the time you get to the 45th president, what the first framers said here, and by the time the, the message trickled down, could be totally different than what they intended in 1787. And that's just a natural function of time. The further you get away from the original document, the further you get away from the intent, because you're really relying on just word of mouth. Thank you. And the next question would probably start with Dr. Fletcher, and it kind of builds on a number of points that you've already made, because obviously the founders could not have anticipated the 230 years of intervening history, the various changes, the issues that government would deal with. So during times of crisis, which we've historically mentioned would be uh, you know, economic collapse, war, perhaps terrorist attacks in this day and age, is a more in a more complex and dangerous world, is it important to have a stronger than normal executive? Yeah, so that, that's a, a really interesting question. And uh, a couple things I, I would say, as John was uh, alluding to, or Dr. Kemp was alluding to, uh, during times of crisis, presidents have really used that as an opportunity to try and expand their power. And uh, some of the most powerful actions that presidents have taken unilaterally have uh, occurred during uh, times of crisis. And some of these have been controversial. Uh, some of them uh, have been needed. Uh, some of them haven't been needed. So uh, one of the presidents who's considered to be uh, one of our best presidents is uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, that said, uh, up to the Civil War and during the Civil War, uh, Lincoln did a, a lot of things that uh, uh, I think the framers would be shocked by. So, for example, uh, he basically tried to start the war by himself before Congress started in, right? He started blockading southern ports. He started increasing the size of the military before Congress had a chance to weigh in. Now, Congress eventually did meet and authorize those things, but he did it before Congress had a say. I'm not sure the framers would have been all that comfortable with that. Uh, uh, at the time, it was a controversial decision, and I think less so historically. Uh, he did the Emancipation Proclamation via uh, basically an executive order. Uh, that's something he just decided all by himself. Now, he said he did it because uh, we were at a time of war, and this was something that needed to happen. But it's an incredible expansion of presidential power. And he's not the only president who's used that as an opportunity. Uh, uh, Roosevelt uh, also expanded power while he was president. Uh, and uh, he did so in reaction to the Great Depression uh, with uh, gold sales and banking deposits. Uh, he did so during uh, World War II and uh, what's often considered to be one of the worst actions the president's ever taken, uh, interning Japanese Americans. Uh, via executive order as well. So uh, often during times of crisis, presidents will use that as a, a, uh, a pretext to try and expand their power. Uh, to, uh, fast forward to 2017, we see a president who's actually making uh, a similar argument. Uh, president Trump has made the argument uh, that because uh, the United States faces potential terrorist threats out there, uh, that uh, we need to go ahead and uh, prevent people from coming into the country uh, from certain co uh, countries uh, that uh, may be affiliated with uh, those terrorist threats. Uh, he's making the argument that during a time of crisis, uh, he needs to have uh, this power. Yeah, he's not the only one who's made that with respect to the war on terrorism. Uh, President Bush um, uh, had a bunch of claims with respect to the war on terrorism. Uh, saying that because we have a war on terrorism, I need to engage in wireless surveillance, or I need to detain enemy combatants, or I need to ignore parts of the, uh, the Geneva Conventions. And all of these are also fairly remarkable expansions of presidential power. Now the question asks, is this a good thing? And uh, I, I would say as a scholar of uh, politics, I, I'd be a, a little bit nervous, uh, even if some of the outcomes end up being good. And uh, I'll just go ahead and use the, the current uh, quote unquote crisis as an example. Uh, the war on terrorism uh, has been going on now for 16 plus years. Uh, when does a war on terrorism actually end? Uh, who, who makes that determination? And uh, does that allow not only the current president but future presidents to use that as a justification uh, for expanding powers? And the other concern that I would have is uh, that we often tend to think uh, that our current time period is uh, one of unique threat. Uh, what I mean by that is we often tend to think that in 2017 we face lots of threats out there. So for example, um, Kim Jong-un or uh, Iran or terrorism. Uh, I'm not sure that's always accurate. Are, are those threats uh, any more terrifying uh, than Stalin? 
uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, I, I think we have a tendency to view those threats as uniquely dangerous. I'm not sure that they always are. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Okay. Um, <laughs> I can never follow up. But anyway, um, all I'm going to say is, you know, historically speaking, um, democracy gone bad becomes fascism. This is something I've read um, in a number of things, and I've actually read quite a bit on fascism. Um, essentially, when we are willing to give up our rights because we are afraid, um, because we are convinced that something's happening and we need a strong leader uh, to get us out, uh, democracy tends to break down. Um, and in fact, most fascist movements have come out of uh, what were originally um, constitutional governments. Um, so historically speaking, um, I guess in times of crisis, we have to, I, I think it's okay, I think it's good to have a strong leader. We need that as a society. We need to have the confidence that our government's gonna do something. Um, but uh, um, we also have to be careful um, with that. Um, I mean, uh, Abraham Lincoln is an example. Um, he suspended habeas corpus, if I remember correctly. Um, in other words, uh, in order to be arrested, in order to be accused of a crime, you have to have a writ from the court based on evidence that you've done some crime. And he suspended that to silence people who were, um, you know, critical of his running of the war. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, um, I mean, it, he was seen as a tyrant by many people. During the, and we, see, we see him as one of our greatest presidents, but because he used his executive power to try to push what he felt he needed to do for this war, you know, uh, took some drastic measures. But again, uh, I'll, I'm just using, like I say, thinking historically. and. Uh, um, we can't let crises change who we are, um, uh, regardless of how badly we need a strong leadership. Um, I think that we have to remember that when the Federalists um, wrote those series of essays known as the Federalist Papers, in Federalist 70, they said that one of the key properties of a president would be somebody that could unify the country. Unity was most important in having that singular figurehead. And not only do we have the characteristic of unity, we also have Article 2 that does give the president direct military powers in being commander in chief of the armed forces. So in times of crisis, it is true that we do need individuals who are able to make quick and efficient decisions because as we know, the government is not set up to move quickly and efficiently. So in other words, in a time of crisis, if we have to rely on Congress to do things, the moment may have passed us by. With that being said, that's why we have to rely on the system of checks and balances because even when the president or the executive branch as a whole does have those opportunities to be more powerful, we have to rely on the other branches to rein them in. And there's a sad reality for presidents, and I, I've said this before and I maintain it, there has to be a certain level of mental illness for somebody who wants to be president because it's not a fun job. Meaning that literally, was it Teddy Roosevelt who says the buck stops here? As president of the United States, whether you have a direct hand in an outcome or not, you get the blame and you get half of the glory when things happen. So the reality is that if I'm president and I'm going to take the blame for what happens no matter what, should I not be the person to make those decisions to justify it a little more? Those are questions that we have to ask, but it is absolutely true that in times of crisis, you need the ability to make efficient and effective decisions quickly and if we had to wait on Congress to do things, things might not always get done. So it is important, but we have to rely on that system of checks and balances to bring us back. Just to talk a little bit more about that, how effective do you think the, the other branches have been in checking the president during times of war? And I'm actually thinking of the examples that uh, both of you used. So uh, uh, Dr. Kemp here used the example of suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, the Supreme Court actually upheld that, right? Uh, and then, uh, actually, it wasn't an example that Dr. Hall used, an example that I used. Uh, in internment camps, Poor the, the Supreme Court actually upheld that as well. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I don't know if there's an answer. I don't know if you would uh, have anything you want to contribute, but have, do you think the other branches have been successful as a check during those times of crisis? Or do you think that they, they, they've been too willing to give in to the powers of the president? given the need for a, a singular leader uh, and uh, the crisis situation? I personally think that they have contributed to the presidency and the executive branch increasing their powers during times of crisis. But when I think about ways that the executive has also stepped in, I also think about like the civil rights movement. So I think about how presidents had to make decisions, particularly to send the National Guard 
quickly so that children could be able to go to school because that wasn't something that the national government, that Congress was doing in an efficient amount of time. So I see ways in which it has benefited us, but I would say as a whole, the other two branches have been very much complicit in the executive branch gaining more power during times of crisis. I would only say partisanship. Um, instead of trying to check the president, it's politically advantageous to support what they're doing to make themselves look good and get reelected and continue to have power in the legislature or the judicial branch or whatever it might be. I think that it's not about you know, what's right or wrong, what's good or bad, it's how am I going to be elected. Um, so if you attach yourself to some powerful figure uh, who somehow convinces everybody that this is the way we need to go, uh, so, like I said, again, it's not about right or wrong and what we should be doing as, a, as, a, as Congress. It's what's going to benefit us um, as a party. That's my personal opinion. But I can't, again, I can't base things on a, an incredible knowledge of these two incredible professors here. <laughs> All right. Within that context, uh, you know, frankly, there's something of an 800 pound gorilla in America today the Trump presidency. And there are those who are, you know, impressed with it and those who are not. Uh, there's been a lot that's happened just since January 20th. So within this context, we know there have already been investigations launched in the Congress. We know that we've had a number of, of federal court conflicts, uh, specifically over the immigration-based uh, executive orders. And there are many who have speculated that this is not going in a good direction, that we have been there before as a republic and that we are seeing the emergence of uh, something of a fight between or amongst the branches. That can become a constitutional crisis. And if and when that does, how does the Constitution address that possible conflict? And, and how does it resolve disputes between or among the branches? You could either use specifically the Trump administration, you can pull to a more historic reference, but what mechanisms are available? What, what could we possibly, as citizens of the republic, have to look forward to? Oh, Take gosh. a shot, whoever yeah. wants to. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I would say that um, there is no constitutional crisis if we would use what's in the Constitution. The only time we come with a constitutional crisis is when we see what's in the Constitution and we refuse to abide by what's in the Constitution. Um, mechanisms to rein in um, an executive branch that may be viewed as wildly and inappropriately out of control. Um, we see them going on now with oversight, with hearings and investigations. What is to come of these hearings and investigations? I ultimately don't know. There are a lot of closed door sessions, which we as the public, we aren't in the loop on what exactly is being said, what is being disclosed. So we don't know what's to come of those investigations. Other mechanisms, of course, include um, the ability to, you know, we have budget issues, budgetary issues. Is Congress going to use their authority to give the president what he wants, or are they going to hold back on some of those things? We have, of course, the ultimate um, measure of the check on the president, which of course is impeachment, but impeachment is not something that we can take lightly because even though there's no limit on how many times you can impeach a president, you better be sure that if you're going for impeachment, it's something that you can get. Because it's not as if we can say, oh, let's file articles of impeachment today, and if it doesn't work, let's do it two years from now. You have then removed the power out of the impeachment process. So I don't think there is a constitutional crisis. I think there's a crisis of morality for people who refuse to abide by what's in the Constitution, but I don't think there's a constitutional crisis. Constitution in and of itself is solid. It's the people that we have an issue with. Okay. Sorry. Dr. Fletcher? Don't worry. I'm one of those people. I'm sorry that you all have a problem with me. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, checks that the Constitution establishes. So I'll talk about congressional checks first and then uh, briefly the courts as well. So congressional checks, uh, Dr. Hall's already talked about a couple. Uh, Congress has oversight. Uh, Congress has uh, the final say on budgets. Uh, so those are some things that uh, Congress can do if they're unhappy with how the president is executing the laws. If they're really unhappy with how the president is acting, uh, you can impeach a president. Although uh, the Constitution's a little bit vague as to what constitutes an impeachable offense. It says that you can impeach a president uh, for high crimes and misdemeanors. And one person's high crime and misdemeanor 
uh, might be another person's fun night on the town, right? <laughs> uh, and so uh, what actually constitutes a high crime and misdemeanor is subject to interpretation. Uh, we actually have had a couple presidents I impeached. Uh, so uh, Andrew Johnson was impeached and uh, Bill Clinton was impeached. And uh, defenders of both would argue neither committed a high crime and misdemeanor, that ultimately the reason why both of those individuals were impeached is because of politics. And uh, in terms of how it, impeachment uh, works, it, it, it is uh, often a political uh, decision. Uh, there's the 25th Amendment, although uh, that's not likely to be used. It requires the vice president, half of cabinet, to say that the president's not capable of doing the job. If the president responds and says, yes, I, I am capable of doing the job, uh, the vice president, assuming uh, he or potentially she is still in the country and uh, hasn't been removed by the president, has to say, yes, in fact, you're not capable of doing the job. Uh, the cabinet has to uh, then go ahead again and say you're not capable of doing the job by a majority vote. And then two-thirds of the House and the Senate have to agree. Uh, you know, that's not a, a, a high likelihood of happening. So uh, with respect to uh, Congress, as Dr. Rall was saying, if, if people just look at how the Constitution works, I, I don't think there is a constitutional crisis. Uh, the, the courts also will play a role. And uh, the courts do uh, check the president. So as we've already talked a little bit about, uh, the framers didn't put judicial review into the Constitution, but Marbury versus Madison uh, did uh, uh, allow the courts to uh, have the opportunity to declare actions of presidents unconstitutional. And although, although the courts were reticent to exercise this power during the first uh, 100 years of the country, uh, especially with recent presidents, uh, the courts have been much more uh, eager to strike down actions of presidents. So we were talking earlier about the fact that uh, President Bush argued that during a time of crisis that uh, he didn't have to respect the Geneva Conventions. The court said, no, 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 you do have to respect the Geneva Conventions. Uh, President Bush argued uh, that uh, US citizens that were detained as enemy combatants uh, wouldn't be able to appeal their status. Uh, the court said, yes, in fact, you do. And uh, there's a chance that uh, President Trump might find out that uh, his order with respect to immigration uh, could uh, be uh, restricted by the Supreme Court. He certainly found at a lower level, uh, at the district and appellate uh, level, that they've been more than willing to say that he succeeded his authority. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll have to wait and see uh, how the Supreme Court views it. So in summary, uh, the, the courts also play an important check. And uh, uh, they, they've been willing to exercise that authority, especially with recent presidents. <laughs> I'm not enough of a constitutional scholar, uh, more like a casual friend with the Constitution, and therefore I don't feel um, really uh, qualified to uh, really explain in detail. I think they did far better than I could ever dream of, so I'll pass on that one too. <laughs> That's very fair. Uh, and uh, actually, a, a, as a, a question that I was asked to raise, uh, it's just a very simple question. Uh, in terms of the style and approach of the current president, Donald Trump, uh, in your view, have we elected Donald Trump before as a president in the United States? Is this, is this a style that has come into the presidency, perhaps for many of the same reasons, that it would coincide with a time when we're disillusioned with the performance of Washington in looking uh, perhaps to drain the swamp? Uh, but, but is he an anomaly in American presidential history, or is he... Is he someone we've elected before? I can talk a little bit about that. Okay. I'm start. okay. <laughs> I'll redeem myself. But anyway, <laughs> more or less, even though I'm not a US historian, I do know a bit about it. Um, Andrew Jackson, somebody that uh, uh, Trump himself has kind of identified himself with. Um, as kind of an outsider, um, uh, somebody who uh, isn't caught up in all the politics and the mess and the swamp, as it's called, and all that kind of a thing. Uh, somebody with the machine um, who galvanized the average Joe um, uh, to vote for him, uh, get him into office, support him, um, com constantly in conflict with Congress, um, but uh, nonetheless able to prevail in time and time again. Um, and his decisions were more personal um, as opposed to really informed. Um, uh, and so, uh, uh, and like I said, he, in, in my mind, uh, as a, again, a casual uh, a, a U.S. historian, um, he changed the presidency in a number of ways. That he, and again, putting personality um, more in than just what's the Constitution saying, but what does he want? What does he not like? Uh, 
and even though it was devastating, I mean, the, the results of his uh, actions were in, in many ways like the, the National Bank, um, uh, which really controlled the economy in the United States. He had that destroyed just because he hated it. And he couldn't care less about economics. He couldn't care less about commerce. He couldn't care about any of that. He just hated it, and so he had it destroyed. And the result was, you know, the thing that checked and kept the uh, economy stable was gone. And then soon after he left office, the massive collapse um, of our uh, of our economic system. So I think that Andrew Jackson um, uh, is a good uh, uh, kind of I don't know, uh, model um, that we can compare to, to Trump. Uh, sorry, President. Uh, I don't want to say it. Donald Trump. Um, I'm sorry, I don't want my politics to come out here too far. But uh, but Donald Trump, I think that it's a very close. Somebody who really doesn't know how all this stuff works, and he just kind of says things because that's what's on his mind, um, and does things because that's what he <laughs> wants to do. It has nothing to do with what's right or wrong. It's what he wants. So. Um, I would agree that um, the current president is not an anomaly in terms of past presidents. And I'm going to answer this question from the perspective of how he communicates with the public. Because often, yes, this is our first uh, Twitter president, per se. But this isn't the first president that we've had to use modern technology to gain power and authority. We can go back to Teddy Roosevelt. He's the one who established what we call the bully pulpit. Now. Bully, during his day, did, doesn't quite mean what we take it to mean today. When he said bully pulpit, he was recognizing that there's no greater position of power that a president can have than to use his office to reach out to the public to gain popular support. We saw Franklin Roosevelt do this when he introduced the fireside chats during the Great Depression. Why did he do weekly addresses to reach out to the people? Because he wasn't getting the support from Congress that he wanted. So he understood that if I communicate directly with the people and I get them to support me, then Congress will fall in line. What we see happening with the current president today even though it is a new form of communication, it is not new in the sense that he's not the first president to use the mass media, to use mass communication, to drum up support among the people to get the other branches of Congress to act. So it's not something new. I would say that on a whole, um, the current president is probably the perfect storm of all other candidates throughout presidential history. I would say. Yeah, so uh, as uh, Dr. Kim pointed out, uh, uh, President Trump actually self-identifies with uh, Andrew Jackson. And uh, if um, my memory serves, I think there's a portrait of Andrew Jackson somewhere in the White House, and he said, you know, he's the person that uh, I identify with. Uh, and uh, in terms of being a norm breaker, uh, Andrew Jackson certainly uh, met that qualification. And uh, President Trump, when he was on the campaign trail, he actually sort of reveled in being a norm breaker. He, he said, look, I'm going to shake things up. And he continues to do that, uh, uh, suggesting uh, that party leadership is not doing what he'd like or that he's going to drain the swamp. Uh, when Dr. Hall is talking about uh, the fact that uh, Twitter is just a modern form of communication, I, I think she, she's exactly correct. Uh, if you think about it from the president's perspective, uh, it, it's a great way to bypass uh, the a, a media, especially a media that he considers to be adversarial, and speak directly to not only uh, his followers, uh, but to uh, Americans generally. And I think one thing uh, that is occasionally talked about in the media, but I don't think often enough, is presidents love to set the agenda. And uh, when uh, Roosevelt was talking about the bully pulpit, uh, one thing he would use that bully pulpit for was to set the agenda. He would privately talk to reporters and say, this is what I'm planning on doing. And he, knowing that stories would get written about it and that he would be able to then focus the nation's attention on these sorts of issues. Uh, Trump uses Twitter in, in pretty much a, a similar way, only he doesn't have to privately talk to reporters. He just goes ahead and tweets something and then when I'm watching the morning news, you know, George Stephanopoulos says, we've got a new tweet from the president, and uh, that becomes the, the talking point of the day. Uh, and in fact, I would imagine that uh, his advisors actually would probably prefer that he use that uh, more as an agenda-setting tool and less as uh, a, uh, an opportunity to settle some uh, vendettas that occasionally uh, uh, he has. Uh, the other thing I would say, and uh, there have been lots of surveys about this, uh, that uh, the American people are, uh, uh, aren't really happy with his uh, Twittering, right? Uh, or tweeting, I guess is the uh, more correct uh, <laughs> phrase. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, Twitter is the issue. It's just the way he interacts. 
Uh, you know, he, uh, I don't think is much different on Twitter than he is in, uh, in his campaign rallies, or he is in speeches. Uh, that that is who he is, and uh, coming from that Jacksonian tradition of being a norm breaker, I think that's something he's uh, often very comfortable with. Okay, so. thank you. That completes our, our question, so if we could. Uh, and now opens the opportunity for questions from you, uh, certainly on any of the topics that have been covered, or if you, in fact, had some other issue. Uh, just a few simple rules. We don't have a traveling mic, so I'll have to repeat your question. Please keep it brief. Uh, it is a, a, an opportunity to ask the question, but a nice, concise question so that we have time for them to respond to, and we have a chance to respond to all uh, of the questions that you have. So does anyone have a question? Please. Excuse me. Um, so you guys addressed technology and the advancement of technology earlier. And I was curious, uh, going, going back to what you thought the framers would think about the modern day, in particular the Second Amendment, how do you feel they would respond to the advancement in the destructive capability of modern weaponry as opposed to the capabilities back then? And uh, Dr. Kemp, your unique perspective from a European <laughs> history perspective of how that differs uh, oh, okay. in our culture versus similar cultures. Okay. okay. I have to repeat the question first, okay. just to make sure we have it on tape. And so, you know, the remarks about technology, specific question about the Second Amendment and the tremendous advancements there. Uh, and uh, since he apparently is a planted ringer of yours, he specifically is asking uh, <laughs> for a more in-depth historical perspective on this. <laughs> okay, well, the Second Was that Amendment. basically it? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so our founding fathers in the Second Amendment and then the European perspective on that. Okay. Um, the United States, uh, or the America, uh, that becomes the United States, is unique um, uh, in how it's, you know, kind of uh, settled um, in its history, and therefore, uh, in the United States, of course, there's a long tradition of needing weapons, um, and, and I guess the debate can go on as to whether we need net weapons today or not um, in our society, is mostly to defend themselves or kill other people uh, who are in their way as they're moving west, or um, uh, finding food and all that kind of thing. So it was a necessity to have weapons. Whereas in Europe, um, and certainly from the Middle Ages, really only the aristocracy uh, were allowed to really ca carry weapons. Um, from the feudal area, era, um, with the uh, feudal aristocracy all the way up into the uh, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, only aristocracy could, the average Joe could not, um, because that's where the power lay, or at least that's where they wanted it to stay. Uh, in the 20th century, there are, there have been um, in some countries like Germany um, before World War II in which uh, carrying of weapons, was uh, having weapons, a shotgun or something like that was okay. Um, but generally, um, as I understand it, uh, most countries in Europe have really kind of limited, um, uh, if allowed at all, uh, any kind of uh, weapons. I think the United States is just unique. Um, our founding fathers, I think, put that in there, in my opinion, and I've read a number of things about this because it is of, of some uh, interest. Um, uh, we didn't have an army. I mean, I think we've taken U.S. history in, in the early part of our country. We didn't have an army. We didn't have an army, a standing army, until after World War II, um, for any intent, for any real, uh, uh, in, in any reality. But and so, really, they depended on militias, militias in times of war, and therefore, it was necessary for them, for the Americans, uh, to have weapons in the event of war, in which they can be, you know, mobilized and, and used in war. Um, in fact, as I understand it as well, again, I'm not an American historian, but as I understand it, there are actually laws in each one of the colonies, in each one of the states, that each household had to have a weapon. And it was inspected, <laughs> and they were checked to make sure you did have a weapon in your house because it was that necessary. Um, now, what the found, what our, in my opinion, what our founding fathers would look at today is like, my gosh, uh, this is a, uh, you know, an entirely changed society, and yet we're keeping that. Um, now, I have weapons. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything that against uh, the Second Amendment or whatever the, the, the um, uh, you know, that attitude might be today. Um, but uh, I think they would be, uh, my goodness, you know. Uh, one thing to have a, a muzzle-loading uh, 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 musket as opposed to an AR-15 uh, semi-automatic that rips people's arms off and heads off um, when you hit it, um, when you hit somebody. I mean, it's, uh, it's hard to say, though. I mean, I, I, I don't know if that answers your question or not. It's a difficult question for me to answer. I don't know if anybody wants to kind of... You know, look at it uh, outside of what I said. But. Um, I would simply say that um, 
This goes back to an intent question with the framers and people who argue going with the intent of the framers, I would say you can't have it both ways. In that when we look particularly at the Second Amendment, if we talk about what was the framers intent, the intent was that people would be able to have weapons to protect themselves because there was no alternative means of protection. That does not exist in the 21st century. Not only that, the definition of a weapon to protect yourself is different than it is today. Would that everyone in the 21st century could have muskets? Great. Let's stop. Let's take time to reload. But that's not the situation that we live in. So individuals, when we talk about the Second Amendment, I personally, as a, as a minority on several fronts, I am a woman. I'm a person of color. I have a problem with reading the original intent of the Constitution because this is the same Constitution that said that I was three-fifths of a person. So if we're talking about original intent, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with this same Constitution reading original intent because it was the same Constitution that didn't allow me to vote, that didn't count me as a citizen. So when we talk about it, we can't have it both ways where in one way we say, yes, the Constitution is a marvelous document and capable of changing and adapting to the times, except for the Second Amendment, the framers meant that we had an unlimited attempt to, to have and bear arms. We can't, we can't do it both ways. Dr. Fletcher? Yeah, I don't have much to add. Uh, the only thing I would say is that the, the, the courts have looked at the question, and although the decision was controversial, uh, they suggested that the framers had an intent for individuals to be able to bear arms, and uh, in that court decision, uh, they, they certainly were aware of the fact uh, that modern technology is much more destructive, um, and uh, so that, that was a relatively recent decision, it was just a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and so it, it, that, that is how the court has ruled, although I, I think uh, uh, both Dr. Hall and uh, Dr. Kemp make good points about how perhaps that, that decision could have gone a different direction. Excellent. Other questions? Yes. Going back to talking about how a lot of things happens behind closed doors <coughs> inside the White House and how we elect our presidents, but we don't have much choice, uh, or like the people have, in general have a choice to impeach the president, and how much we actually don't know as a nation. I guess the question I'm asking is, do you guys think that the Constitution will ever evolve in a sense to have the people have more power, rather than letting the branches and the government in itself become all of the power ruling the people? I think we can just answer that question. I'm sure, thank you. That was very well stated and, uh, and loud enough. Thank you. Anyone? Sure, so uh, yeah, it's a really good question because uh, it actually addresses something we haven't really talked too much about uh, that the framers actually contemplated. So uh, we've talked quite a bit about the fact that the framers intended for the president to be in a system where there are checks and balances and separation of powers. We've talked a lot about uh, how Congress has interacted with the president and the courts have interacted with the president. Uh, another check that uh, the framers considered, and uh, it's one of the reasons why uh, we do elect the president, is they thought, look, uh, if the president is acting improperly and Congress and the courts don't act, uh, then the president will be subject to an election in uh, four years. And uh, so well, this is actually something that was part of the discussion back at the Constitutional Convention. And they thought that the American people would act as a check against any potential abuses that a president might engage in. And uh, that's something that they, they contemplated and uh, thought that uh, would be necessary in some cases. Um, I guess, um, could I just ask you, what do you mean by power, more, the people having more power? Meaning um, <laughs> being educated more on things that are going on in policy and in government that we, as of now, do not have, like, um, we don't, we're not allowed to know these things. Okay. Like, so, I don't know what the good word is. Okay. Okay. I was just curious what you meant by, what, what you meant by power. Um, I think the answer to your question um, is complex in many ways because the reality really is I don't know if we as a citizenry want to know every single thing that the government knows. There's a reason why there are things that only the president knows because we as a public in general might not be able to handle some of those things. Um, as far as being educated, the public is way more uneducated than it should be to have power, meaning I don't necessarily know that it this moment right now, I would trust the general public to make a decision about something like impeaching the president. That's not something I would feel comfortable with. 
But I don't hold the government accountable for that. I hold the citizens accountable for that because that's information that's out there. Case in point, um, I'm sure the attendance in this room would be reduced by half if we didn't offer extra credit. <laughs> But that's, I mean, but that's an excellent point in the sense that people aren't coming to be educated for the sake of being educated. So how do we solve the bigger issue of educating a citizenry that doesn't see the value in simply knowing what their rights are, simply knowing how the government works if it's not for a grade, if it's not for extra credit? No offense, I'm glad you came. Happy to see you. But the reality is that's the bigger issue in terms of <clears throat> giving the people power is how do we encourage the people to know what is out there so that they can translate that into making better decisions. You don't have to. <laughs> Just if you want to. It would be my CNN informed uh, responses <laughs> instead of a scholarly response. So I think I'll, I don't want to diminish what you guys said. Okay. Just to yeah. build upon what Dr. Hall said, uh, the American people get the Congress they deserve. And they get the president that they deserve. Mm. Uh, they get uh, the laws that they deserve. Uh, and uh, that, that, that is how it works. That's what the framers intended. The, can I just add, the people are a check. We have elections every two years in this country. That is our ability to check the government, to pick whom we want to be in office. Is it our fault that we look for people who have a certain look? Is it our fault that we look for people who carry certain statuses in order to view them as being qualified? Those are the bigger questions that we have to ask, but we are a check. We do have the power. Whether or not we use that power effectively and efficiently, I could talk a whole nother hour on that, but I'll just leave that. All right. Uh, and uh, just as an FYI, in the 2016 election in the state of Nevada, of the 18 to 24 year olds, only 5% were registered to participate in the state of Nevada, the worst in the country. So uh, I, I think it brings home the point of uh, you get what you deserve. You can sit around and complain, thing. but if you don't register, you don't vote, you don't get involved in 25 different ways we could tell you right now to get involved. Take some responsibility, people. Uh, one final question. Yes. Um, what are the biggest problems you see in America today? <laughs> well, I've made problems, like made problems. Like made Having to answer questions like that is, <laughs> has got to be one of the biggest problems. Yeah, go. Anybody? 5,000 words or less, you know? <laughs> um, I, I can go first if you want me to. Well, I guess I would, uh, are you talking political problems? Are you talking about societal problems? Or, uh, uh... Just overall, general, like America. There's like huge problems, that, just like one big problem you see today. <laughs> I think that uh, the root of several problems in this country is intolerance. Intolerance to hear what other people have to say. Intolerance to try to understand the perspective of others. Intolerance of understanding that even if I hear a perspective that's different than mine, it doesn't mean that we still can't be friends. It doesn't mean that we still can't break bread together. It doesn't mean that we can't coexist. The root issue for many things that's happening in this country, and that's anything from racism to sexism to classism, you name it, is intolerant. That's me personally, but... <laughs> I guess uh, just thinking about it um, and, and kind of uh, following from what you said, um, I, I've noticed a lot uh, of uh, kind of this debate and this resistance to political correctness, okay? Um, and I think that's a problem. Um, people define political correctness, I guess, as, you know, not speaking your mind, being very careful about what you say about certain groups or certain issues or whatever it might be. Um, and, they, and much of our population kind of looks down on that. No, um, we're going to be politically incorrect. We are not going to show respect. We are not going to uh, appreciate somebody else's experiences. We're not going to do any of that stuff. No, we're going to say what we want to say. Um, and what that does, I think, is exclude, that it excludes uh, people in our, in our society. I think that uh, uh, without that respect, I mean, that's really what political correctness is, simply having a respect for somebody else's views or history or experiences or whatever it might be. Um, what happened to politeness? What happened to courtesy in our country? Um, you know, we're all Americans, regardless of our different viewpoints, and we should accept the fact that we all have different views, instead of fighting and tearing ourselves apart because we don't like what somebody else 
think. So what uh, somebody else votes or what uh, somebody else's skin color might be or whatever it might be, we're all Americans. Why can't we be politically correct and just respect each other? Uh, I think that lack of respect and a pride taken in that lack of respect is sad, to say the very least. So uh, I can think of some other problems, but uh, I think I'll uh, <laughs> kind of follow along this train because I, I like the direction that it's going in. Uh, there have been some pretty interesting surveys over the last couple of years about how Americans view each other, especially uh, members of political parties and how they view each other. And uh, so one of the surveys that, uh, that was done is, uh, is the uh, other party a threat to national security? And uh, about 40% of Democrats think that Republicans are a threat to the nation's security, and about 40% of Republicans think that uh, Democrats are a threat to the nation's security. Uh, uh, another sort of interesting survey question, my numbers may be a little bit off on this, uh, but uh, I think they're in the general area. Uh, uh, would it be okay for your kid to marry someone of the opposite political party, i.e. opposite of your political party? And uh, about a third of Americans uh, say, no, 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 that that ain't happening. My kid is not going to uh, marry uh, either a Democrat or a Republican. I, I think those are pretty frightening numbers, to be quite frank. Uh, building upon uh, the, the intolerance and the uh, we're all Americans thing. Uh, it's okay to have a jersey that says Republican or okay to have a jersey that says uh, Democrat, uh, but when you can't see anything but the color of your jersey, uh, then I, I think uh, that, uh, that that's not uh, healthy for the United States. And I'll just give a quick sports analysis. A uh, quick sports anal uh, analogy. Wow. Uh, so uh, I went to UCLA, and I, I tend to hate uh, USC. I mean, uh, <laughs> hatred may be uh, not enough of how I feel about them. I despise uh, those uh, Trojans. Uh, that said, uh, uh, in, I have to admit, it's actually a pretty decent university. Uh, and uh, I've had friends who've gone there, and uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk to them occasionally, uh, just not at the uh, middle of November, end of November. <laughs> uh, we need to do that as a country as well. We've got to recognize that uh, just because you're a Democrat or Republican doesn't mean you're evil, it just means you have a different perspective, and you still want good things for the country at the end of the day. Uh, Democrats uh, don't want the country to fail, Republicans don't want the country to fail, independents don't want the country to fail. We all want it to succeed. We just have different views on uh, what will make it succeed and the tendency to uh, view others uh, as uh, being the worst thing ever, I, I don't think is healthy. Just to follow up on that, our differences, I think, is what makes us strong. That we're not just one, you know, one thought, one mind going one direction, but we have a lot of, of ideas and a lot of thoughts and a lot of a a opinions uh, in our society, that, and we have the right to voice those. Um, and I think that all of us having the right without having to worry about being put down or shot or, or whatever, we ha it makes us strong. It makes us a powerful country. And if we try to stifle that, um, I think that weakens us. Um, anyway, but just can't fall. No, I agree. And you, you began by talking about Madison. And uh, Madison loved that type of diversity, right? He talked about how that diversity uh, in a larger republic was going to be a strength of the United States, not a weakness. And I think sometimes uh, if we do become intolerant, I, it was a question to the panel, and I'm just the moderator, but they gave me a mic. So I would suggest <laughs> that another major problem is today is our inability to understand what is truth yes. or what to believe. Yes. And I have never, you know, I've never seen it in my lifetime uh, to reach the point uh, where we are. And part of it is the, the breadth of the media, the, 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 the notion of how uh, we have the impact of social media, which is you know, still relatively new to the scene. Uh, we have, uh, it used to be that we would say, be, well, because I saw it on TV or heard it on the radio, it must be true. And now it's in any form of social media, any ad that appears on social media, any, anything you see on the internet, uh, it must be true. And, and we seemingly have no ability to decipher or to more or less position and understand where in the spectrum of opinion this source may be. Uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, I, and I personally have never seen a president 
accuse the establishment press of fake news. I, I just, I lived long enough to see that. Just Dr. The, Hall. Just to kind of um, <laughs> continue with what you said, this goes back to the notion of education. The more educated I am, the less likely you are to be able to convince me of a fallacy. So this is why education is so important. And obviously we believe in education because we are educators, but we also know that the more that you know, the more that you will be able to tolerate those other beliefs, the more that you will be willing to entertain ideas that may be different from what you believe and still understand that at the end of the day you can coexist. So education is what helps us to understand when we are being fed lies and to question what we are being told. I like that. An open-mindedness, um, but also critical thinking with education. Um, that when you hear something, you read something, someone says something, you don't just take it at face value. You're asking questions. What are they saying? Why are they saying it? Where's the evidence? Let me look at that evidence. Do I agree with what they're saying? That's what educated people do. Um, uh, so and critically important, so that not just open-mindedness, but the critical thinking as, as educated people. I think is important. Okay. Well, our time, of course, uh, uh, has come to a close. If we could give one more round of applause to our fantastic panel. I can assure you some of these discussions will continue after the, the group. Wanted to remind you again to sign up if you are here for extra credit. Make sure that you take your free Thank copy you of the U.S. Constitution. Thank you for spending time with us today, and happy birthday to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs>